We are in the book of Hebrews. We are beginning Hebrews chapter 3 today. Before we read Hebrews 3, I want to read a, a compatible portion to this portion in Ephesians uh, chapter 2. When we speak of the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord is the temple of the Lord. Just like the house is where you live and where you dwell, so the Lord's house is where He dwells. And you can come to His house and you can be with Him. And so the Lord's house is the Lord's temple. The temple is the dwelling of God. And it's the place where God is worshipped. So in Ephesians chapter 2, we read in very much compatible language uh, a little bit of a further explanation to open up Hebrews 3, our text for today. So Ephesians 2, 11, I think I made a little typo there, should be verse 11 to 22, not 12. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, uh, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to you who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. I'll turn, if you would, to the text for today's message. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, holy brothers... You who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who is faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also is faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Let us pray. Yes, Lord, we do pray. May the indwelling Spirit of God be at work in our midst, enabling us as the author of the Word to understand the Word, enabling us, Lord, to draw near through the cross of Jesus Christ and be bound to you in covenant love. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you have an outline with you of the message today. I encourage you to follow along in the outline, even take notes upon it. It's helped keep you on track, help keep me on track as we go through this text together. I said before, I like to say it again, the book of Hebrews is all about heaven. God's throne, where Christ is seated as royal son, is in heaven on high. Christ is already ruling over the world to come, crowned with glory and honor 
a reference to heaven. Christ's death itself upon the cross was for the purpose of bringing many sons to glory, that is, to heaven. The terms, the Sabbath rest, the, the promised land, the temple, the city, these are all Old Testament code names for heaven. As high priest, Christ is now located in heaven. The holy brothers have a heavenly calling. The holy of holies in the presence of God is in heaven. The hope that is set before us is the hope of heaven. Our gathering right now for worship is to draw near to God who is in heaven, where Mount Zion is the vertical axis wherein we ascend to enter the heavenly Jerusalem. The Old Testament temple was a copy and a shadow, Hebrews tells us, of the heavenly things. Christ has entered heaven to present his blood in chapter 9 of Hebrews in the presence of God. Chapter 11 tells us that Abraham was an exile on earth because he desired a heavenly country, even a city whose maker and builder is God, a city above in heaven, and a city that is also equally to come, the unshakable and heavenly arrival of the kingdom of God. We, through Jesus Christ, as our prophet, priest, and king, already enter heaven, and we will yet enter heaven. There's an already and not yet structure regarding heaven in the book of Hebrews. Already that unshakable reality exists. And will one day, though invisible to our eyes today, will encompass the whole of visible reality. In the book of Hebrews, we see this wonderful contrast between earth and heaven. That contrast is carried on as we see the eclipse of the old covenant which belongs to earth and the new covenant which ushers us into heaven. Things that are symbolic and shadowy in the old become permanently replaced by heavenly realities achieved by the eternal redemption of Jesus' suffering and glory. So the book of Hebrews as I said, is all about heaven and all about holding on to it as a delightful possession that is ours in Jesus Christ. But also the author to the Hebrews reminds us in chapter 2 that our transgressions and disobedience to God's law is what bars us from heaven. Uh, it brings us to face to face with God's justice and the recognition of his judgment for a hopeless uh, retribution. The author to the Hebrew also sets before us not only the reality of God's law that threatens us, but he sets before us the author of our salvation, uh, the one who made purification for sins and sat down at the right hand of God, for which we must be most grateful. It's through Jesus, Son of God, Son of Man, that we have the recovery of our lost hope of heaven. The author tells us he helps us who are helpless as a merciful and faithful high priest who made propitiation for the sins of his people. Praise God. We get to come to worship with the assembly even during this time of our wilderness trek. Just like Israel of old, we now are able to draw near with the assembly to heaven. And so the author to the Hebrews continues in chapter 3 here right before us to point us to heaven and to Jesus in whom we believe and to continue in that belief as he seeks to unite us in worship with the angels as a hope of heaven in this world and if we continue, as he says, even in the world to come. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. The saints' heavenly calling. Number one, your outline there. We're called holy brothers 
They're called holy because Jesus has purified his people by his blood. Uh, we continue to struggle with sin. Praise God. The power of his blood continues to purify us. So we come and worship him. We are the holy brothers. And we are brothers to Christ. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 12. He took flesh and blood. He calls us brothers because he's, he's man. Uh, we are, as it is, bound at the hip to our brother, the Lord Jesus, and share in his fabulous uh, humanity. And since Jesus partook of flesh and blood, being, as author says uh, from Psalm 8, made for a little while lower than the angels in his earthly trek, uh, and because of that, he can bring to heaven uh, these holy brothers uh, he can bring them to his throne in heaven, which is above the angels now uh, in glory. And they are able to partake uh, even now uh, of heaven, to share in heaven through, as the author says in verse 1, this heavenly calling. Now the heavenly calling is not only a calling from heaven, it's a calling to heaven. It's an effectual call. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, the Apostle Paul says, We are called with a holy calling, uh, a calling that, that, that is arisen out of eternity past and the purposes of God's grace uh, to us, to whom this mighty effectual calling has come and led to our salvation. And even as Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldeans, uh, Horizontally, he came out of Ur, he came out of the world, and he was brought into the promised land. He was called out. And so too in the new covenant in Jesus Christ, we are called as the church out of our earthly lays vertically uh, to proceed uh, to that heavenly ascent, uh, to be uh, in fellowship, to partake of what Christ's humanity partakes of even now we are able to partake of as we commune with him uh, in the call the effectual call uh, of our ascent and so we we sang about that as we opened worship the god of abram praise uh, we ascend uh, along now with abraham into that heavenly region and so in very compacted form uh, God's people are identified as separated. We are holy brothers. We are separated from this unholy and evil world because of Christ. Uh, we are a heavenly people. And not only is our ultimate residency there in the promised land, but even now we have opportunity to ascend it in our gathering Sunday by Sunday, as Isaiah chapter 2 in the call to worship spoke of, uh, the nations flow in uh, to the house of the Lord, up the mountain of the Lord, which is above all the other mountains. And so if anyone ever wants to pose the trivial question to you, what's the highest mountain on earth? You tell them, well, that's Mount Zion. And they'll say, oh, no, it's not Mount Zion. And you say, yes, it is. The Bible says that because it's goes right up into heaven itself. And so that's the mountain that the nation stream into, that I stream into every Sunday. Would you like to come to church and climb the highest mountain with me this Sunday? And we will enter in with the nations, the holy brothers, into the heavenly regions in Christ. You can say that. That's true. And so we, like Abraham, are strangers and aliens in our, our earthly trek through this world. And like him, through Jesus, we are the holy brothers uh, that uh, truly have heaven as our home and, and thus our relationship to this world are strangers and aliens because we're not strangers and aliens to the kingdom of God and to heaven. We look for that city. We enter that city. And as such, we are directed, aren't we here, in this very opening verse, to consider Jesus to fix our minds intently on Jesus. Intently, longingly, lovingly. 
Look and consider Jesus. He is what we confess. He is who we publicly identify with. He is whom we swear our allegiance to above everything in this world that might challenge that oath. And that public identification with Jesus happens when we join with the people of God every Sunday. That's where we publicly confess. That's where we publicly gather as His people to fix our minds on Jesus. This is where we publicly answer the call to come, let us worship and bow down. Because the book of Hebrews is all about heaven. And it is equally about the worship of the people of God as they assemble together to consider Jesus as we ascend to heaven. We consider Jesus and all that He is. Chapters 1 and 2 of Hebrews. Remember what those two chapters are about. Chapter 1 is about the divinity of Jesus. Son of God. Sharing in the essence of the Father. Chapter 2 is about the humanity of Jesus. He had to be made flesh and blood. We must consider His distinctive uniqueness. He is Son of God. Son of Man. And He has come to bring sons to glory. Chapter 2, verse 10. But we also must consider Jesus, as this text tells us, as apostle and high priest. He is the apostle. He is sent. That's what the word apostle means. It's a play off the word for send, the verb. It's a noun. Uh, it means more than that. It's a very full and rich word. Trace it all the way back to the Old Testament. But Jesus here is called the apostle. He is the sent one. He is sent from heaven. He is sent from heaven to partake of flesh and blood. Or as John puts it in his gospel, the word, the heavenly word, became flesh and dwelt among us. So Christ was sent from heaven. But he is also high priest. And as high priest, he returns to heaven. He is that high priest over the house of God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20. And we'll find in chapter 4 that this great high priest has passed through the heavens to minister on our behalf on the basis of what he did on earth in making propitiation for sins. He is postured there permanently as it is to give grace and mercy to help during our wilderness trek and during our seasons of difficulty. Consider Jesus. Ponder. Think. Muse. You know what muse is? It's the opposite of amuse. We live in a world of amusement. It means disengage, disengage the brain and just get all bubbly and sensuous and whatever the moment is. Amuse. Here we're called to muse, think, ponder, meditate, engage that mind to reflect on Jesus, the apostle sent from heaven, the high priest who returns to heaven to bring us, his holy brothers, many sons with him to glory. He has opened the way. Praise God. Consider him. He can do this. He can bring many sons to glory as our high priest because he is faithful. He is the faithful high priest. and He is able to bring saints into the heavenly house. Verse 2 says, Who was faithful to him who appointed him just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. Jesus as a high priest was faithful over the house of God. Therefore, because of he was faithful, he's counted worthy of glory and honor. Be counted worthy of glory and honor, I mean on the basis of his worth, the basis of his merit. Now, we should be hearing covenant of works there, okay? On the basis of his obedience to the covenantal arrangement, uh, that if he obeys, he will inherit life, he will inherit heaven. Jesus was faithful and counted worthy of glory and honor, eternal life, eternal kingdom of God. 
As the author says in chapter 1, verse 9, you have hated wickedness and loved righteousness. Therefore, God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Uh, he has achieved the, the, the throne of God at God's right hand because of his faithful covenantal obedience. He has merited what we cannot. He's a faithful high priest. And so the angels, the four, rather the four uh, creatures sing, Thou art worthy to receive glory and honor. Thou art worthy. The faithfulness of Christ was the faithfulness to obey God's law, the faithfulness to the commandments of God's law. Oh, we read elsewhere in this book of Hebrews, that he was holy and innocent and undefiled. We read he's without sin. He was faithful to the commandments of God. But he was also faithful to bear the curse of the law. Jesus Christ, as he stood before that cross, that final out as the pressure, as the expectation of what it all meant something that he had never experienced would begin to undergo in the most profound way. He said, not my will, but thine be done. As he stood before the cross, he bore the curse. <clears throat> Listen up, O saints. You holy brothers, you have a home in heaven above to which we draw near and worship gratefully in reverence and in awe, along with Isaiah of old. You have that because of Jesus. He's a faithful high priest who has secured heaven and has prevented your sins from barring you from heaven because he bore them there and made propitiation for them as our high priest. And so when you come, when you get up in the morning, you feel like I'm too dirty to come to church. My conscience says I'm out. I'm not in. I face these other people who are doing so well and I'm not. Which is a lie. But it's the devil telling you that. No, we come stumbling and fumbling into this holy Worship of the Lord. And yes, we at times, if not all the time, say, what am I doing here? I can't possibly belong. I can't possibly fit in. But you come and you hear. There's a faithful high priest for the likes of you who represents you before God. And he shares his conquest with you. He shares his possessions of heaven he gives grace and mercy to help. In your time of need, He qualifies you with His righteous obedience to God's commands. He cleanses you with His righteous obedience of bearing the curse. He came to do the Father's will, to clear the way for you, to bring you to glory in this time. So come with all your feebleness, come with your failures, but come and faith looking, considering Jesus. Don't consider your guilt. Bring it to your faithful priest who made purification for your sins. A lovely verse in Hebrews 9.14. How much more will the blood of Christ cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? That means service and worship. Liturgical service. Cleanse your conscience to serve. The living God. And that's the wonder of Isaiah chapter 2. It sees the nations. Unclean nations. What are they doing coming into the house of the Lord? How do they find their way in? That can't be. But as Isaiah sees it by prophetic vision. And they come in because they don't pretend. They don't come with pretentiousness. They come and they confess and forsake their sins. And they come boldly and confidently because of the high priest who's cleared the way. 
And they publicly confess even more boldly than their sins, Jesus. They confess Him who's dealt with their sins. And they come because they no longer belong to this world. The unstable nations are viewed like the, uh, the waves of the sea, the dark sea. Unpredictable and harsh and stormy and dark. They come out. The nations come out of that instability, into the stability of the house of God and the mount of God. They no longer belong to this world. They belong, along with the holy brothers, to Christ. They don't look to the earth to fill their hearts anymore. If they did, they wouldn't come. Already happy. Got what I need. Don't need to come. <laughs> but Isaiah sees them coming because they're looking away from the emptiness, the carrot on the stick that they've had enough of. And they're coming to the mount of the Lord. They're coming to this faithful priest over the house of God who feeds them, who welcomes them. And they not only come to the house of the Lord, they are the house of the Lord. They ascend to enter the house above, but below as they come, they are the house of the Lord by the Spirit of God, Ephesians chapter 2. God dwells there. God is worshipped there in their midst. He joins them together like a temple. As Paul says in Ephesians, stone to stone, joined together. Assembling, God does, the temple of the Lord for His worship. Out of these unclean, uncut, rough cut stones that behold we find in the book of Revelation, these stones are valuable gems that sparkle with glory in God's house, in God's city. They therefore must not turn back. That's what the author to the Hebrews is saying. You don't, don't turn back. Don't turn back to the earth. Don't turn back to the old covenant, which is based upon this earth, which is part and parcel of this earthy, sensuous arena. Don't turn back. The author to the Hebrews is saying over and over as he presents the contrast between old covenant and new covenant. Don't turn back and away, but turn toward these invisible realities that have arrived in the new covenant in Jesus. They must continue to hear the heavenly call. They must continue to draw near to heaven, to their high priests, week by week. Yes, it's true, the author of the Hebrews points out, that Moses' house had glory. Moses built the Old Covenant house called the Tabernacle. Our ladies' study, which is on hiatus right now, have been studying the Tabernacle, the house of the Lord in the wilderness. That's what this world is now. We're, we're in the wilderness and we, we come to, to, to God's house. But Moses built that Old Covenant Tabernacle. Read about it in Exodus 39 as as he very carefully walked through six stages of building to then finish, same word used in creation, he finished after six days. And then the Spirit of God came down, the glory of the Lord came into that temple. That was Moses' house. It was good. Moses built it faithfully, carefully, according to the instructions, just like Noah faithfully built the ark to invite people into. It was good. But it was not good enough. <laughs> it was not good enough. It was built according to the heavenly pattern. It was a copy of what he saw on the mount. So the earthly was a copy and shadow of the true and heavenly house that was on its way. Just as the author says right here, is that Moses is Work as a servant in God's house, verse 5, was to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, having to do with Christ, who would build the house of the Lord, not on earth, but in heaven, as the faithful high priest. No, Moses was a servant 
of the shadowy, of the pictorial, of the symbolic, of the type. It's the new covenant in Jesus Christ. He would come as one, as son. Worthy. Worthy of glory. Not a, not a glory that would pass. Not a glory that would fade. Not a glory that would be overcome by the curse and the temple destroyed under judgment. No. Jesus would be worthy to build the glory of the eternal temple of God. And therein, Jesus, as priest over the house of God, would dispense grace and mercy to you and to me if we would but long for it. In Christ is this glorious bringing together of the heavenly house and the holy brothers and drawing near in union, closeness, in communion, heart satisfaction with Christ, with God, who in Jesus Christ dwells with his purified people in heavenly places. You see, brothers and sisters, this is what church is. This is what church is about in the book of Hebrews as we ascend the mount into the house of the Lord to be gladly consecrated and therein be transformed from earthly to heavenly by the word of God, transforming us, transforming, metamorphosizing us, earthbound worms to heavenly butterflies. We enter the house we are the house because of the Holy Spirit from heaven. What a disaster, isn't it? What a disaster to neglect the assembly of the house of God. What spiritual dullness, what utter deception to think that we can neglect the house, the heavenly house of God in this life and yet somehow enter the heavenly house of God in the life to come. No, we are they who continue to come. We come. Why? Because we want more of Christ. More of heaven. We long. We look for it. We get a taste here and we long to be filled at the feast in the world to come. But the saints, us, we are his house. As the author of the Hebrew says, and because we are his house, we continue. We continue. See verse 6. Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if Indeed, we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. If we continue, the author to the Hebrew says. You see, that's, that's why Christ, God appointed His Son as high priest, to gather sons of glory, to assemble them. To assemble them into the heavenly regions in Jesus Christ in this life, to reproduce do you have a little picture now ahead of time, a little taste of the reality now ahead of time that will be revealed and realized in full in the world to come when heaven comes down, when the temple of the Lord will be forever dwelt by His people? He now, though, incorporates us. But we must continue to come. Again, verse 6. If indeed... We hold fast our confidence we are his house. There must be continuance in it, a perseverance in it. And so the author to the Hebrews solemnly warns us, we are his house if we continue to hold fast. Number one, our confidence, our open-heartedness, as our hearts are to be highways to heaven, and we are confident in the worth of our high priest to join us there and to feed us there. And our boast in our hope, that is the end point of it all. Rejoicing and knowing what we've got now. The fullness is on its way. And we rejoice in that hope. We must continue in it. Hold on. 
hold on to this confession, this public confession in assembling in the house of the Lord in this world to trust in Jesus as we hold on to Him, publicly confess Him, identify with Him and His people and His house. Because we know that feast that feast that we now have in the house of the Lord is on its way in its fullness. We long for it. We can't wait for it. That house of feasting. And the author to the Hebrews assures us it is ours. It is ours. If we simply keep coming back for more, it is ours. Keep coming back because no one, because nothing in this world satisfies like being close to Jesus. The heavenly apostle, the high priest of our confession to whom we draw near in worship. Let us pray.